I welcome members and also viewers who may be watching our proceedings on Oireachtas TV to the public session of the Oireachtas Select Committee of Foreign Affairs and Trade and Defence. The Dáil on the 19th December 2018 ordered that the revised estimates for public services in respect of the following votes be referred to this committee for consideration, namely Vote 27, International Cooperation, Vote 28, Foreign Affairs and Trade, Vote 35, Army Pensions and Vote 36, Def Defence. At today's meeting, the Select Committee will consider the estimates for Vote 35, Army Pensions and Vote 36, Defence and report back to the Dáil. On behalf of the Select Committee, I welcome the Minister of State, the Department of Antishuk, with special responsibility for Defence, Deputy Paul Joe, who, uh, also accompanied by his officials. I thank the Department for providing the briefing material in advance of the meeting. The proposed format of today's meeting is that the Committee would deal with the votes on a programme by programme basis. At the, outset of the uh, at the outset of the consideration of each programme, the Minister, Minister Kyo can give an overview of the programme, including outlining any pressures likely to impact on his department's performance or expenditure in relation to the programme in 2019. The floor would then be open for questions from members of the committee. I ask that members put their questions on the specific programme in order that we can progress in an orderly and efficient manner. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that members should not comment on, criticise or make charges against the person outside the Houses or an official either by name or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. I remind members and witnesses to turn off their mobile phones or switch them to flight mode as they interfere with the sound system and make it difficult for parliamentary reporters to report the meeting. They can also adversely affect television coverage and web streaming. Members receive briefing documents and the revised estimates. I now invite Minister of State Joe to make his opening statement. Minister. Uh, Chairman, members of the committee, uh, I welcome this opportunity to engage again with the Select Committee on Foreign Affairs, Trade and Defence to consider the 2019 revised estimates for Vote 35 Army Pensions and Vote 36 Defence. I have a short opening statement which will I uh, set out the overall position and update the members on some of the main developments within the defence sector over recent times. The defence sector is made up of two votes, Vote 35 Army Pensions and Vote 36 Defence. The high-level goal of both votes is to provide for the military defence of the state, contribute to national and international peace and security, and fulfil all other roles assigned by government. Accordingly, uh, defence sector outputs are delivered under a single programme in each vote. The combined estimates of the Defence Army pensions for 2019 provides the gross expenditure in excess of €1 billion Euros an increase of €60 million, Euros, or 6.4 per cent over 2018. The 2019 provision comprises of €758 million Euros for Vote 36 Defence, an increase of over €50 million, Euros, and €249 million Euros for Vote 35 Army Pension, an increase of €10 million. Euros. The Army Pension Force is a single programme entitled Provision for Defence Forces Pensions Benefit. It makes provision for retired pay pensions allowances and gratuities uh, payable to or in respect of former members of the Defence Forces and dependents. Retirement pensions, gratuities and disability pensions account for 99 per cent of all expenditure. The 2019 estimate provides a gross sum of over €249 million uh, for, Euros for the Army Pensions vote and some €239 million, Euros, uh, million for this allocation covers expenditure of all superannuation benefits for former members of the PDF and certain dependents. Pensions benefit, benefits granted are for the most part statutory entitlements one, uh, on, once certain criteria are met. There are currently 12,480 pensioners paid from the Army Pensions vote. During 2018, some 340 Defence Force members retired in pension, and a similar, similar number in broadly anticipated for 2019. As the Committee will be aware, it has been uh, my stated intention to seek extra funding for military pensions as part of the overall future budgetary negotiations, and solid progress has been made on that uh, front. As announced in Budget 2019, the gross uh, allocation for Army pensions has been increased by €10 million Euros to some €249 million Euros for this year, which is very welcome. This builds on a funding increase of uh, €9.5 million in the, 20, uh, in the 2018 estimates. The 2018 Spending Review of Defence Forces Pensions Expenditure, which is published in uh, Budget 2019, was carried out as part of the 2018 Round of Expending Reviews and was undertaken jointly by officials from the Department of Public Expenditure Reform and my department. Uh, 
The review concluded, among other things, uh, that the underlying trend of rising military pensioners, pensioner numbers is likely to be maintained in the coming years. The spending review recommended that the Army pensions vote uh, should be allocated resources in line with the review's cost analysis from the 2019 onwards to ensure that the full funding demands are met. And I want to turn to vote 36, Defence, which is delivered under a single programme entitled Defence Policy in Support Military Capabilities and Operational Outputs. The Defence Forces vote of 758 um, for, uh, for uh, 2019 a million includes a pay and allowances allocation of two, 529 million euros, while the remaining non-pay allocation of 229 million euro provides mainly for the renewal and maintenance of essential equipment, infrastructure, and standing and operational costs. <laughs> The pay allocation of 529 million euros for vote 36 provides for pay and allowances of over 10,400 public service employees, including 9,500 PDF personnel, 550 personnel employees, and 355 civil servants, and makes provisions for increases due under the Public Service Stability Agreement 2018-2020. The Public Service Stability Agreement 2018-2020 contains proposals for increases in pay ranging from 6.2% to 7.4% over the lifetime of the agreement, and by the end of 2020, the pay of all those who earn less than 70,000 will be restored to pre fmp levels. There has been ongoing recruitment within the Defence Forces over recent years at both enlisted personnel and officer level. This includes general service recruit apprentices, cadets and direct entry officers. The current recruitment plan envisages some 800 new entrants uh, being inducted uh, across the Army, the Air Corps and Naval Service this year. These recruits will avail of the highest levels of training and in return the Defence Forces will benefit through the injection of uh, energy and enthusiasm that every organisation and particularly the Defence Forces need. Promotions are also ongoing within the Defence Forces, with some 600 promotions across all areas of the Defence Forces in 2018, meaning one in 14 serving members were promoted. In 2017, under my direction, the Department of Defence brought issues of recruitment and retention in the Permanent Defence Force to the attention of the Public Service Pay Commission. The Department of Defence has provided data at, uh, as requested by the Commission for consideration, and the Commission's work is ongoing. Uh, my department will continue to engage throughout the process. The budget allocation also provides for over €2 million Euros for reserve defence forces pay in 2019. This will allow for 26,000 training days for reservists this year. I acknowledge and appreciate the commitment and enthusiasm of the RDS mem RDF members who provide voluntary service throughout uh, the country and the department's white paper is clear that there is a committed requirement to retain and develop the reserve defence force. A key ongoing challenge for the Reserve Defence Forces is to recruit and retain personnel, and two recruitment campaigns for the Army Reserve and the Naval Service Reserve are planned this year, one in March and the second in October. The non-pay allocation comprises both current and capital elements. The current expenditure allocation of €123 million Euros for 2019 provides mainly for expenditure on ongoing Defence Forces standing and operational costs such as utilities, fuel, catering, maintenance, information technology and training. The capital expenditure allocation for vote 36 has been increased to €106 million Euros for 2019, an increase of €29 million. Euros. This represents an increase of 38% on the 2018 allocation. This will allow defence organisations to undertake a programme of sustained equipment replacement and infrastructural development across the Army, the Air Corps and the Naval Service as identified and prioritised in the defence white paper. Among the main equipment programme priorities planned for 2019 are the ongoing upgrade of the Army MOAG, armour personnel carriers replacement uh, and the Air Corps Cessna aircraft purchase of military transport vehicles and the mid-life uh, refit of the naval vessels. The Government is committed to ensuring that the Defence Force's built infrastructure can use to be enhanced and modernised, and to that end, the Defence Vote makes provision for increased investment in this area, with over €28 million Euros allocated for 2019, an increase of almost €5 million, or 20.6%. Uh, 
There are a number of projects planned for 2019 which are progressing on a phased basis to upgrade and maintain the infrastructure essential for the Defence Forces. The overall capital allocation of €541 million Euros for the defence for the period 2018 to 2022, as set out in the National Development Plan, emphasised the importance attached by, by this government to ensuring that the defence forces have the capability necessary to deliver on, the, uh, uh, deliver on all roles assigned by government. The funding will play a vital role in, uh, in ensuring that the priorities identified in the white paper can be met and that the uh, defence forces can deliver fully across all roles. I would now like to briefly mention some of the key roles and outputs delivered by the Defence Programme. The Defence Forces continue to make a considerable contribution to their international peace and security role. As of February 2019, Ireland is contributing 673 uh, permanent Defence Forces personnel to nine different missions throughout the world. In addition, personnel are deployed to a range of international organisations and national um, representations. The main overseas missions in which the Defence Forces personnel are currently deployed are the United Nations Interim Force in Lebanon, UNIFIL, with 458 personnel, and the United Nations Disengagement Force, UMDUF, in Syria, with 136 personnel. Until recently, Irish troops served as part of the Irish, um, Joint Irish Finnish Battalion in UNIFIL, including a small Estonian platoon. Due to other national commitments, both Finland and Estonia withdrew from the Irish uh, Finnish Battalion in UNIFIL in November um, uh, 2018. As an interim measure, an additional contingent of approximately 106 Defence Forces personnel deployed in UNIFIL, missions to cover the backfilling of the Finnish contingent over a 12 month period. The additional commitment will continue through 20, 20, throughout 2019 as Ireland has assumed full duties and responsibilities of Irish BAT up to November 2019. Efforts to source a partner to country to replace the Finnish contingent are progressing well. Since October 2017, the Naval Service has been participating in the EU Naval Mission Operation Sophia, which specifically seeks to encounter human trafficking and smuggling in the southern central Mediterranean Sea. The question of a further deployment to Operation Sophia in the Mediterranean in 2019 is being considered in the context of the ongoing situation in the Mediterranean and the overall EU response there to the demands uh, on the Defence Forces, our overseas commitments and available resources. The Department of Justice, Equality and Engarda Chicana have primary responsibility for Ireland's domestic security uh, supported as security, uh, domestic security as required by the Defence Forces uh, part of its aid to the civil power and function. This role is multi-faceted uh, in, and in 2018 included the very tasks set out at the Garda Sheikhana uh, Air Support Missions, Central Bank Security Guards, Prisoner Escorts, Explosive Ordnance Disposal Callouts and Naval Service uh, Diving Operations. The Defence Forces also provide assistance to the principal response agencies tasked with responding to major emergencies. By way of example, in 2018, the Defence Forces were deployed on a number of missing person searches. The Naval Service conducted fisheries, boardings and the Air Corps undertook a number of emergency aeromedical support missions. The professional competence shown by the Defence Force in undertaking these roles is greatly valued and appreciated by all stakeholders and was fully uh, illustrated by the extensive and wide-ranging assistance provided in response to the last March's severe uh, weather emergency. The civil defence is also funded from my department for it and remains a vital component within each local authority emergency uh, arrangements. Volunteers in civil defence have responded very effectively when required, most notably during the aforementioned uh, weather emergency. I have secured an additional €500,000 from the Dormant Accounts Fund in 2019, which will be used to enhance civil defence four-wheel drive capability. This will ensure that civil defence continues to perform its core function of supporting the principal response agencies as set down uh, by Government in 2015 White Paper on Defence. The allocation of over €1 billion Euros for the defence sector for 2019 emphasises the importance attached by the Government to ensuring that defence forces have the resources necessary to deliver on all roles assigned by Government, both at home and overseas, and demonstrates the Government's commitment to ensuring that the defence forces have the capabilities necessary to deliver on all their assigned roles. Committee members have been provided with briefing material on the individual subheads for both the defence and army pensions estimates, and I look forward to a positive engagement on any issues that you may wish to discuss. Um, thank you, Minister, for your detailed presentation. I ask members if they could um, pose their questions you know, in the format for each programme. So, Deputy Chambers. Yep. 
Thanks, <coughs> thanks, Chair. Um, Minister, in the allocation as part of vote 36 of 529 million for paying allowances, um, you've mentioned that there's 9,500 permanent Defence Forces personnel, or that's what you've planned for. Um, are you confident that you'll have 9,500 personnel uh, to pay for that vote? And if you aren't confident that you will, where will that money be diverted to? Because obviously there's concern within the Defence Forces that the savings, I'd like to know where the savings are going from the pay or where they're being diverted to. Uh, and there's a view that that's cannibalising the over, overall defence budget, whereby you have um, pay savings is, is diverted elsewhere. Can you clarify if there's any military specific allowance increases um, as well? I, I want to know about the. Is there a review or not of the terms and conditions of recruitment? I asked that in the previous session, but I just want clarity on whether there's any review or delay in the terms of conditions of recruitment for the present recruitment phase in the, um, for the reserves and the naval service. Um, also regarding the uh, obviously defence forces budget, and we had this discussed last year, there was you know, the, uh, the evaluation of defence spending, they felt that it was reducing or stagnant in real terms. Can you respond to that? Um, and just in terms of the Public Pay Commission, uh, when now do you expect that to report? Obviously, we've had a moving deadline there, but can you provide the committee with a current position on that? Um, just to keep right, also regarding Operation Sophia, um, what you said that your overseas commitments are, are subject to available uh, resources. Um, what, where, where is that at, obviously, in terms of it, could our available resources compromise any future operation? Are you confident that you have an appropriate allocation? And also, just on, on a year on year basis, I want to know um, what was the underspend or overspend in capital last year, and how is that fed into your projections for this year? What was the under sorry, sorry, Deputy, I the last one? So what was the under or overspend on capital allocations from last year and how is that fed into the capital allocation for this year? What was the current or what was your where your in terms of current expenditure, what was your projected allocation and your under or overspend? And I want to know what your um your your under or overspend was around pay year on year, because I think we need to know if money that was allocated last year is how, how much of it is feeding into uh, this year or how much was returned to Deeper and the Central Exchequer. Just in terms of the, um, the CASA replacement, um, is the, re the cost around, around the replacement of, the, of CASA and the, uh, the funding PC12s, is any money being diverted from any other budget for that? Um, and can you clarify that it's not affecting any of your, of your recruitment plans. We've had significant debate around Project Ireland 2040, and obviously you mentioned the National Development Plan in your uh, statement, and we know that the Children's Hospital has overrun by a significant amount, and you mentioned a 541 million allocation. Have you been approached, or have there been any formal discussions between your officials and officials in other departments about the defence capital allocation being affected? by the Children's Hospital overrun, and can you give a clear commitment and clarification that the 541 million you mentioned um, isn't affected in, uh, in any way? Thanks, Deputy Chamber Minister. Uh, when you mentioned the Children's Hospital overrun, my budget will not be affected in any way. Uh, the CAS uh, replacement, uh, we're not diverting funding from, from, uh, from um, anywhere. Regarding the capital overspend, Deputy, I'll get you a, a detailed answer on that. I, I, I won't be able to give you justice here now by, by going through that. Um, on Operation Sophia, there is a review of the mission uh, at, at, at the moment. And when the, they, they got an, the UN got an extension uh, for the mission, once I get full uh, brief of, um, of, of, of that, uh, then we will make the decision. I'm in New York, I think the end of March, uh, meeting with John Le Poir, the, um, um, the UN Under Secretary, and that is one of the items on the on the agenda when I'm meeting him. On the um, pay commission, um, 
the, both the Secretary General, the Chief of Staff, and um, personnel from Department of Public Expenditure and Reform uh, met the Pay Commission this morning. Uh, I'll be getting a full update this evening on that from both uh, uh, from, from my officials. Um, uh, but I do know uh, on a timeline, and that well, I don't want to be specific in saying give a, give a, a, a timeline because I don't want to tie myself down to because the pay commission is fully independent, and it's not up for me to tell them when the report, or is it a matter for the minister for finance and public expenditure reform, Pascal Dunne, who telling them when to when to report? But um, 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 uh, we we will we will. Um, uh, hopefully, I, I'd like to hear as soon as, as, as soon as possible. But they have a job of work to do. I know that there's a huge amount of work going on, face-to-face uh, -face interviews and also an online uh, questionnaire as well for members of uh, the defence forces. Uh, there is no delay in recruitment uh, whatsoever. Um, um, in act as a matter of fact, we will have a recruitment um, um, competition, the recruitment plan for proposed for Defence Force and visit that some 800 new entrants uh, being inducted across all services and competition streams in 2019. The Naval Service General Service competition closed on Monday, 21st of January 2019, with 969 applications. These applications are currently being processed. Or processed. The cadet ship competition and general service rec uh, recruitment competition will commence shortly. The aircraft apprentice uh, technician competition is expected to launch in Q1, but details are yet to be confirmed. The naval service continues to recruit direct entry uh, officers from brigade watchkeeping, marine engineering, and electrical engineering roles. And the defence forces are also accepting applications for qualified doctors for um, uh, careers in uh, the medical corps. And in addition to the traditional recruitment, a range of alternative recruitment approaches are being developed aimed at addressing vacancies in specialist areas. A scheme has been introduced which permits former officers with a specialist skill set to re-enter the permanent defence force and ranges are in train to provide a similar scheme for former enlisted uh, personnel. This will take uh, legislative changes. Currently, there is a direct entry uh, provision for those with professional qualifications, which is utilised in the recruitment of medical uh, officers and engineers. A working group is examining the scope for greater use of such direct entry um, recruitment for certain specialist positions. And the recruitment process is carried out by the Defence Forces, and they are responsible for promoting uh, um, promotion competitions and processing uh, applications. Um, so I'll go through the military authorities advise that targeted medical campaigns using traditional and social media cinema and print will continue to be used in the upcoming recruitment campaigns. An additional €50,000 has been allocated in 2019 for a recruitment advertising campaign. Uh, that will bring up to €295,000 um, in total. A variety of recruitment initiatives will be undertaken throughout the year, including local and national outreach events to attract young people to the competition uh, process. The recruitment process itself is monitored and appraised on a continuous basis to ensure it remains uh, fit for purpose. Uh, to complement uh, this approach, it has been decided that the Department of Defence, in conjunction with the military authorities, will review all elements of this process. And uh, this work is in the very early uh, planning uh, stages. This is something that I look for uh, myself: is that we would have a re review of the overall recruitment process. Uh, similar to the review as I had to the uh, CNA scheme, uh, where uh, somebody from uh, an independent person will come in uh, that has absolutely um, no involvement in either the department or with, with the military, and to look at this in an objective way. And I think it is very important that we do look and bring people in from the outside, and if there is lessons to be learned, uh, I think it's very important that, uh, that uh, we have that. But the most important thing out of the whole recruitment thing issue is that there is funding for 9,500, um, uh, uh, also on the Public Service Stability Agreement, um, that we've been fully funded for um, um, uh, all the pay increases, in support, operational costs, uh, an increase in capital. For um, its essential equipment and infrastructure, up to 29 million euros, an additional 10 million for army um, pensions um, um, to fully fund the vote. As, as um, I know, and I'm sure, definitely from, since my appointment in 2016, it is something that I wanted to address because I was actually quite concerned about that was a shortfall in the, in the pensions uh, uh, vote, and I'm delighted now 
that I, I got the um, uh, after getting a commitment last year from Minister Pascal Dunhu that he, he fulfilled on the commitment that we were fully funded for for the for the pension uh, deficit. Uh, just there would be no there would be no uh, delay on recruitment whatsoever. Um, and I will come back to you, Deputy, on the other on the other um, issues. But all savings arising from um, uh, are, will be retained within defence, and that will come, when I come back later in the year uh, with uh, revised with, with the revised um, um, funding, I, I, I will then uh, exactly set out where, 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 where that goes. But we are spending over one billion euros uh, for defence, uh, uh, and. Um, uh, this is the first time ever that we went over €1 billion, Euros, um, uh, and I think it, it just shows the commitment by government. Absolutely, we have challenges, and we will continue to have challenges, as every other department and organisation ha has, has, has its challenges. Deputy O'Snoddy. Um, uh, a number of questions already asked, so I'll skip, skip over them. Um, there's, a, there's a number of areas where the estimate is below what it was, or what the outrun was last year, uh, or even 2017. And just, I, I find it odd, because it's some of the areas that we have been talking about. Um, so, for instance, barracks uh, engineering, so that's sub A12. And then you go to uniforms, clothing, and that, again, that's about 2 million, or just under 2 million below the figures. Uh, Defence Force Communication and Information Technology, and we've talked about that here, about cyber security and, uh, uh, and, and that, and that's uh, three million below military education training, half a million below what was spent the previous year, defence logistics and travel, um, and then you go into uh, an area which is kind of the A18. Now A18 also relates to A7. So that's the Defence Forces Medical and Healthcare Support. A uh, substantial increase, um, and the logic for that is four, four, four million to, to, because they've shifted something that used to be come under civilian support into that area. And that's kind of an accounting process. But I want to ask there um, does that subhead 18 now cover um, all of the, the psychiatrists, the problems that uh, not being able to? employ a psychiatrist directly and having to get outside uh, consultancy, uh, is that accounted for in, in that estimate of £7 million that's set aside for the drugs, dressings, equipment, um, and then it says professional consultants. Um, but when you go back to A7, which is the Defence Force's civilian support, so theoretically you've taken £4 million out of that and given it to A18. But that suggests that if things stood as they were, uh, it was a substantial increase this year in the pay and allowances for civilian staff, not off the two and a half million about that's indicated there, but in fact it would have been six and a half million. Um, so that's a substantial amount that isn't fully explained. Obviously, uh, the, 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 there is some provision, there is quite a number of um, civilians working, I think it's over 500. Um, there was something else I was going to ask. Um, yeah, the this expenditure on the naval service, the equipment and the support. Now, obviously, um, last year was, for some reason, an exceptional year because it, it, it had peaked last year and it's dropped back. Um, is that because of um, new equipment being more efficient? And if so, why was it so high last year? I would have expected purchase of fuel and lubricants, specialist training and all of that, given that um, Irish naval vessels are on Operation Sophia in the Mediterranean continuously, that the, the figures would have been around the same. Um, just like I, 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 I find that odd. I think Sinead will fall. And Tara? There's some, there's some very technical questions, Deputy, that, that you uh, asked there, okay? 
But I'm going to give you a detailed answer in, in written reply. Is that okay? Thank you. Rick. Because I, I just I wouldn't be able to actually get the full information here directly myself here now. Okay, so I, I will give you a full reply on on, 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 on that. Um, you talked there about um, <coughs> some million employees. Um, the, there was a number of the, 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 um, the number of civilian employ, uh, civilians employed has dropped considerably over the years with a marked decrease over the economic downturn. The recruitment of civil uh, employees for military installations is an ongoing uh, process based on a combination of the filling of uh, consequential vacancies which have arisen due to promotions and retirements and the filling of uh, priority vacancies on the basis of identified requirements. Uh, a programme of targeted recruitment has been in place uh, to fill uh, priority uh, uh, vacancies. In 2018, eight civilian uh, appointments were filled by external competition and 17 by internal competition. As of December 2018, there were an additional 39 candidates in security medical clearance prior to appointment, 47 retirements, resignations uh, and no debts in service. Uh, there was no redundancy packages paid out in, in, in 2018. Um, and the Naval Service Equipment and Expenses um, uh, Deputy uh, for equipment it is uh, 2 million maintenance of vessels uh, 6.3 marine fuel and lubricants uh, 3.7 3 um, and um, specialised training 167,000 and miscellaneous 723 that brings it a total of 30 million I'm not sure what it was. The, no, there was no major, there was no, there was no, no major change, uh, deputy, in that from from the previous uh, um, from the previous uh, year. Um, there was no additional fuel costs in 2018. Sorry, there was uh, except fuel costs. Um, uh, if you look at um, um, the, the, the outturn from 2017 was 13.7 uh, million, <coughs> and in 2018 the outturn is 17. Uh, million, but that of uh, course maybe cost of the increase the cost of fuel and things like that. It's a substantial amounts, four, four million increase in the est between the two estimates. Um, I'm not querying whether it's, it's just it's, it's, it's odd because I presumed that the same level of engagement, same level of, of activity within the, the navy would. Um, Kind of have this, this, something similar. Um, if if there had been a small drop on a continuous basis, then that. You well, could I say that, that like, like you know, it, it just it depends on the level of uh, of um, operation during 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 the year. But like I, I know that for a number of it, the cost of fuel went up, as you know, uh, substantially in in um, in 2018. Um, like there was a considerable increase in in per litre. I just, I, I, one, one final question. Yeah, yeah. I, I hadn't asked. It was to do with the chaplaincy and the, the clergyman. Um, uh, it's a valuable service and it ca causes and helps uh, a lot of those who are sometimes in distress. Um, but the, there's an increase despite the same number of um, chaplains. Um, just, it, it, it seems odd. It, it might be just to do with the pay rates or the, their grades. I'm just I'm not, not, not sure. Uh, that goes under the, the pay increases under the Public Service Stability Agreement of yeah. the 2020. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. But let thought. me say that the chaplaincy service is uh, absolutely vital. There was 15 chaplains in 2017 uh, and uh, there were 16 in 20, uh, 2018. And we now have a lady, uh, Church of Ireland, uh, chaplain in situation in in situ in the Cora, I'm almost uh, uh, certain, but they do provide a very important uh, service, specifically when they, when they when they go overseas. Um, thanks, Minister Deputy Tony McLaughlin. Chair, for here at game. There's not much more for me to ask because I know that uh, my two colleagues have asked most of the questions. Minister, you're welcome. Uh, just, um, you did mention it's, it's in relation to uh, an update on, on the pay commission. I know that you have explained um, uh, perhaps maybe uh, in as much detail as you can in relation to that. That was one of the questions I had. And also in relation to the uh, recruitment uh, competition and the time frame for additional uh, recruitment within the um, army. And also, um, Perhaps maybe to update me on the commissioning from from the ranks. Uh, perhaps maybe you might um, just elaborate on that, if you would, please. Thanks, Joe. Uh, 
Thanks, Deputy Minister. Um, uh, Deputy, I'm delighted to say for the first time in, in 11 years I will have a commissioning next um, Wednesday or Thursday of next week. Uh, this is the first time that there has been a commission from the ranks where, where um, um, members of uh, the Defence Force and the ranks will be, will be fully commissioned and it is, I think it's absolutely um, uh, brilliant. I'm not sure of the exact number. I think it is... Um, it's well over, over, it's over, it could be up to 26, 27, definitely I'm not 100, but I, I'll come back in that. Thank you. Uh, on the pay commission, um, um, I've given Deputy Chambers a full yes. brief of the, of sure. the pay commission. This has gone back since uh, 2017 under my direction. The Department of Defence brought issues of recruitment and retention uh, in the Defence Force to the attention of, of uh, the pay commission. Um, the Commission produced its initial report in May of 2017 and highlighted recruitment and uh, retention issues in around the health area and, uh, and defence, where they, both of them were, were prioritised. They concluded their, their um, health in October, November of 20, 2018, and I would hope that they will um, report shortly in around regarding recruitment and retention within uh, the defence forces. But to repeat again that the Secretary General of the Department, the Chief of Staff of uh, the Defence Forces and um, members of the Department of Public Expenditure Reform met with the Pay Commission this morning. I'll be getting a full brief on that later on uh, this evening. Um, and uh, I know that there is a lot of work going on in the background where they are consulting with members of uh, the, the Defence Forces. So, as, in, as I've stated before, this is a fully independent uh, commission, mm. and uh, it is up totally up to them to when they um, when when um, when they will be um, reporting. Um, that's the Pay Commission and the Recruitment Deputy. Uh, we will be uh, advertising recruitment. Uh, recruitment. I, I've given a detailed answer, but um, uh, very shortly. How shortly? Uh, I'd say definitely in the next. In the, I'd say in the next couple of weeks. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Chair. Sir, Clear up, thanks. Deputy Chambers. Uh, sir, just you know, sir, no, no mention of the um, a pathway or anything around trying to implement the working time directive and uh, the process to see it delivered. It's a huge issue for uh, members of our defence forces, and the fact that there's been no discussion of it in a budgetary context is concerning and I think the fact that it probably rests in the subheading related to the courts and the challenge of the department and the state of people's wish to see a pathway delivered for it I think is disappointing. Um, I just want to know in terms of the number of doctors employed, you've said there's 24 doctors employed, what, what's the, what's, what number, uh, what's the strength or what number uh, how many vacancies are there of that in that, and how many vacancies are there around specialist, uh, um, like for example in psychiatry? And then you've mentioned as well that the payments in respect to defence forces for professional consultants and specialists have started to be met from subheading A7. And in A7, um, there's little mention of it, but one issue I would have is that there's a lot of uh, personnel around the country who are having to utilise, say, PD4s specific fund or their own family to get specific appointments um, through the private sector and through private hospitals because of the demise of the medical staff within the defence forces. So you have people being forced to retire as a result of their medical condition or physical uh, difficulty and that in, in some circumstances that's because of the lack of intervention. So if someone has been two years with an arthritic knee for example or where they haven't got the appropriate intervention because they're waiting for the public system and then there's a shortage in of cohorts and the medical staff within the defence forces they're in limbo and then they're not fit to continue so i just think the consideration needs to be given um around some type of fast track process where people who require you know this uh, for their employment and are forced out because of their medical circumstances where they could have had the appropriate intervention and do you have any uh, pathway around the numbers of doctors employed or, 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 or also around the level of availability for diagnostics for members of our defence forces because I have lots of examples of people who have to join the queue that's there despite the 17 billion the state is generally spending but I think part of what was built into the terms and conditions for members of the defence forces was that they did have a medical corps that there was 
meant to be access to diagnostics and medical specialties historically, but we haven't advanced the historic um, specialisation of, of medicine through our defence forces. They're left in limbo, and I, th I just think as a general point, your department should look at that, because um, there's genuine people being forced out because of uh, medical uh, circumstances that I think we, none of us should should allow. You know. Thanks, Deputy Chambers Minister. Uh, Deputy, there, there should be there is 24 uh, doctors at the moment. I don't believe we should be required 30, but we are recruiting doctors, and, uh, and as, as you well know, uh, that there is um, it's a challenge for us to get doc doctors in. But we've changed the method in getting doctors in, and has worked successfully for us. Um, I'm not aware of maybe if you have individual cases uh, of people who had to um, uh, retire on health grounds uh, that you believe weren't uh, looked after. If you give me the details, no, it, it, my example was say someone if you're waiting, yeah, if you were saying they were waiting on, on yeah. some on some. So, give so me, if, if they weren't fit, they weren't fit to continue based on their yeah, present no, medical I, I, if condition. You have, if you have individual cases, I'd be, I'd be delighted. I'd be delighted. There are lots, they, and, yeah. and, and on the basis that if they had got the diagnostic. Process Area, yeah. commenced and then perhaps got the intervention, but then they were at the retired you know. state, so they may not have got a promotion or they may not have been able to advance a promotion um, because of the circumstances they were in and they were left in limbo. So well, it, it, is, it saying, is an issue. What I'm saying, if you have, if you have uh, details, personal details of somebody, I, I'd gladly take them off you. No, yeah, no problem whatsoever. You. With regard to the working time directive, um, uh, it has been uh, decided by government to amend the, the organisation of the Working Time Act 1997 to remove the blanket exclusion of the Defence Forces and in Garda Khan and bring them within the scope of the Act subject to the application of the exclusions of uh, derogations from the EU Working Time Directive. Uh, I'm the li liaison with um, the Minister for Employment Affairs and Social Protection, Regina Doherty, spoke to her on this uh, last night in order to expedite the legislative changes to remove the blanket exclusion of members of the Defence Forces. And the focus is on ensuring compliance with all aspects of the uh, legislation. Significant work has already been undertaken and continues to progress. Uh, as you are aware, I answered on PQs only last week that there is a civil and military team uh, working working on this. This is a very complex... They were blocked. Um, no, there, weren't, there was no one blocked. Actually, they were blocked for oral questions. They were. Um, um, but that is because there's ongoing litigation at the moment. Um, um, but this is this is a priority for me. It's a priority for the military management and and my, and my department. Minister, just with regard to subhead A18, and it's, it, it goes back to Deputy Chamber's point. That defence forces medical and healthcare support. There's an increase there of 133 percent. What, what provision is that? Is that buying in health services uh, or what? Payments in respect of visits by members of the Defence Force to professional consultants uh, and specialists have historically been met uh, from subhead A7, A7, and these payments are now met under uh, subhead A18. That's why you see the, the increase. And uh, this is reflected in increased estimate for A18 A of uh, 4 million euros. Um, Deputy Snuddick. <coughs> All of the question is more a policy one than um, in relation to that. If, if you're outsourcing the, some of the medical um, services um, just because of need, consultants, so in, in the past, some soldiers wouldn't go to the, the army doctor because part of the duty of the army doctor was to report somebody unfit. If they're now going outside, to a consultant or a doctor, does that doctor have the same duties to report to the army that they may be unfit? This has arisen in terms of people who are travelling overseas or who might be in, in, in charge of, uh, kind of <coughs> mechanically propelled so trucks or things might put the other people at, at risk because of whatever condition they have. If somebody, for instance, is in se severe depression or suicidal, I know from having talked to quite a number, they will not approach the army doctor because they will be put on sick leave, which means they won't get access to overseas travel, they won't, uh, or overseas uh, missions, they won't get allowances, and that means that the likelihood is that they will be on the breadline, which means it adds to their depression. 
So there, it, it, it mightn't be appropriate for today, but it's something that definitely, if you can't answer today, should, should be looked at, given that you're now having to rely on outside um, uh, doctors. Uh, and, that's, uh, and I, don't, I haven't decided yet whether I'm in favour of the doctor to tell him the, medic, the military authorities in all cases um, or, or not, but just it is, seems to be an anomaly. So the minister? Well, um, a lot of this goes around it would be a clinical decision for the doctor, but let me say there's two types of... So we have our own in-house GPs on occasions yeah. that we have to bring in locums. Um, and they would see members of uh, uh, the Defence Force, and of course they are. They would report back to, to <coughs> put on the medical files. But I presume, Deputy, um, if a member of the Defence Forces is living in, in um, South County Wexford and they wake up in the morning, they're unable to go to work and they have to get some sort of a doctor certificate, then I know that would be a matter of a clinical decision. If they went to the local doctor to say, yes, well, you have to stay out because of whatever clinical diagnosis he's going to give the patient, uh, well, that would be a matter of, of a clinical decision of, of the doctor to, to pass on that information to, um, uh, to the, to the Defence Forces Medical Board. Um, th thanks, Minister. Minister, just with regard to, I think, each of my colleagues, we mentioned the, the, the importance of the Reserve Defence Forces, and we'd like to see the numbers increase in that. And I think I took the opportunity yeah. at this committee a number of occasions to outline the importance of the of the Reserve Defence Forces over the years. Now, the, their association made a very good presentation to us here some weeks ago, and one of the issues they pointed out was the requirements in regard to eyesight to join um, as opposed to permanent Defence Force members, and it was an extra demand. And one other issue that, are, that arose is that those members cannot serve overseas and thankfully today the Reserve Defence Forces is very representative of society of the different careers, trades, professions. And oftentimes there are specialist knowledge there. It may be in the medical area, whatever, where people could serve abroad in a, in a, in a very useful capacity. It, it's, it's not strictly for the estimates, but do you propose to change legislation to allow, allow Reserve Defence Force members serve abroad? Um, yes, but there is, we, we did definitely, and there's, there is no gap at the moment to, um, to do that, but at least uh, something that I have in mind to, to, to do is, uh, you, you were referring to the first line reserve? Yeah, reserve Defence Forces, as yeah. we know them, yes. Yeah, yeah. But just on, to go back on the, the issue, a report regarding eyesight standards required for the Naval Service Reserve recruits uh, has been submitted by the Flag Officer Commanding Naval Service to the General Staff and the findings of this report will be considered in due course. Um, I would like to have this sorted before that we would um, before we would go ahead with the recruitment of, of um, the reserve recruitment campaign, um, if, if at all possible. Um, but I'm hoping this will be sorted out um, uh, shortly. Um, two in the 2019 recruitment campaign, two recruitment campaigns for Army Reserve and the Naval Service Reserve this year, one in March and uh, second in October. Uh, support has been provided to maximise recruitment to the RDF include the use of social media and outreach activities uh, for reserve members. And PDF rec uh, recruit uh, exit interviews uh, now contain information on applying to become members of uh, the uh, RDF. Um, uh, the RDF inductions, there was 124 altogether in 2018 and uh, there was 139 in 2017, 80 in 2016, 344 in 2015, and 157 in 2014. The Chief of Staff has appointed um, an officer uh, to liaise directly with, uh, with the RDF um, and to make sure that they get involved, that the recruitment campaigns are run locally and everything like that. Um, but you know, it's, it's getting numbers in is, is a problem. Um, but like we are absolutely anybody want to, re to reply for the reservists, um, the, the, the applications will be opened uh, very, very soon. Thanks, Minister. And to be fair to the Chief of Staff, when he was here with us, um, he gave a very strong message to us that he wanted to see the Reserve Defence Forces members increased as much as possible. Minister, I mentioned... Just there was a... a, a in, 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 for, um, on Mondays, an RDF Reserve Defence Forces Mondays, in 2018, there was 1,091 uh, people involved in in um, in 
the training, the, 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 the training that, that is provided. Yeah. And I think, Minister, it's very important in regard to the Reserve Defence Force that we keep the local element to it. Back a number of years ago, I know that the local res Reserve Defence Forces from my own area, there were, there were some proposals by the Department, by the, by the Defence Forces, to regionalise it to, to Dundalk to cover the Cavan, Monaghan, Longford area. And I, I raised it at the time through, through, through representation to your seven through parliamentary questions, and thankfully that didn't happen. I think it's very important to keep that structure at a local level, where there's a, a knowledge of, of the workings of the, of the Reserve Defence Forces at local level, and that there's that local input. And I think over the years, people with local knowledge were able to recruit locally as well. They knew the type of person a young lady, young man, that they thought would be suitable for recruitment. And I know many of them went on then to, to, serve, to serve in the permanent defence forces subsequently. And another thing I mentioned to the Minister previously was, and, and I can understand why it may be difficult to recruit at times, but you take a lot of our colleges of further education, or PLCs, they run security courses. There, there may be a cohort of young people pursuing a career hoping to pursue a career in that area of work, who are studying those security courses in our colleges of further education at the minute, they might be a cohort who would be worth um, making sure to create the awareness of that the, that the Reserve Defence Forces was recruiting, and I sincerely hope that that would be done as well. It's OK. I'll take, take your comments on board, Chairman. Perfect. And Minister, just, just with regard to, to Brexit, and we sincerely hope that the, there, there won't be uh, a no-deal situation, and we sincerely hope that Britain leaves the European Union with an agreement. But, um, and we hope that we don't need additional security measures in the border region. And I outlined previously the, the major mistake, as I saw it, of the closure of Dooney Nail Barracks in Cavan. That, that barracks in the central border area was the most modern barracks in Europe. So it was, and I sincerely hope that we. That the Department of Defence Forces don't have to deploy additional personnel to the border region. But in the event that they had, and we sincerely hope it doesn't come to that, I, I, I would put a strong message out that they cannot go to inferior accommodation. That if personnel of our permanent defence forces, additional personnel are being assigned to the border region, that they go to proper accommodation. We know when the troubles blew up in 69 and 70, it was a diff different situation, and it was difficult at the time with inadequate accommodation and all of that. But, Minister, the, the former Dune and Ale barracks is still, is, is still a very, very sound modern structure in Cavan, and I sincerely hope that if personnel, if additional personnel are assigned, that facilities such as Dooney Nail Barracks would be used, and I sincerely hope that it doesn't come to that. But it's just an issue I think it, it's worth bearing in the back of our minds. That's okay. Uh, Chairman, I, I, I take that on board. And we don't contemplate on, on, a, on, on that happening, but um, it is a matter for Garda Shea Connor, uh, the security of the state in the first instance, and if we are required, it will be um, under aid of the civil power. Uh, but I take your views on board. Thanks, Minister. Deputy McLaughlin, yes. To find out in relation to um, the new uh, cook house at, at, at Lone, what's the up to date? And also in relation to Finner Camp, the plans, any, uh, any uh, plans for uh, an upgrade or, or what, what are the future plans there for, for Finner Camp, uh, Minister, please? Um, the cook house at Lone is under construction at the moment, Deputy, uh, and I understand it will be finished by, I think it's. Um, by the end of uh, sometime October, November, at a total cost of um, 4.1 million euros. Uh, I'm not sure of any any um, works being in Finner Camp, but I do know uh, previously uh, Finner Camp has has been well looked after in in um, there has been a five -year plan. Um, new facilities and built there, and also there's a five-year plan being built up. So. Uh, we are in contact with the, the, my department are in contact with the general officer commanding in each of the brigades to see what, the, what their priorities are. Okay. Thank you.
On behalf of the Select Committee, I want to thank <coughs> Minister of State Deputy Cho and his officials for attending today and for dealing with the, the, the issues raised by our members. As we have now completed our consideration of the revised estimates for vote 35 and vote 36, the Clerk will send a message to that effect to the Clerk of the Dáil in accordance with Standing Order 90. Under Standing Order 89 2, the message is deemed to be the report of the Committee. This Select Committee <coughs> is adjourned until the 28th of March when we will meet again to consider the control of economic activity occupied territories bill, including correspondence received in relation to that bill. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Chairman, and, uh, and the clerk and uh, committee members for their input into this.